Welcome everyone to Rare Matters, fine-tuning biomarker testing to identify and target uncommon but actionable genomic alterations in non-small cell lung cancer. I'm Dr. Nate Pinnell, Professor of Medicine and Thoracic Oncologist at the Cleveland Clinic Towson Cancer Institute in Cleveland, Ohio. And joining me today is my colleague, Dr. Laura Tafe, who is Associate Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth University. Today, we are going to be talking about how we can have a better understanding of the importance of gene fusions and other uncommon alterations in non-small cell. We're going to talk about why uh, it's critically important to identify these. We're going to talk about some gaps in testing and understanding of the importance of these, uh, how we can collaborate with our colleagues in pathology uh, and other multidisciplinary teams to identify these patients and talk about evidence-based best practices to help you identify these patients so that they can uh, get the treatment that they need to clinically benefit. The first part really focuses first and foremost on why is it important that we identify these rare alterations in patients with lung cancer. Let's start with a fairly typical case of someone I might see in my oncology clinic. This is a 63-year-old non-smoking man who has a persistent cough that leads to a chest X-ray showing a nodule in his left lung. A CT scan is done showing a three centimeter left lung nodule with enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes and multiple liver and lytic bone lesions consistent with metastatic disease. Although uh, all of the lesions in the lung, liver, and bone are amenable to biopsy, either through interventional radiology or bronchoscopy, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the different issues that go into choosing the optimal place for biomarker testing. Uh, in this case, a needle biopsy shows adenocarcinoma of the lung with a PDL1 IHC of 80%. Uh, a limited panel of biomarkers, including EGFR, BRAF, KRAS are negative, as well as ALK immunohistochemistry, ROS1 fluorescence in situ hybridization. Um, the patient is anxious to start treatment, and the local oncologist has suggested starting pembrolizumab, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, and the patient presents to us for a second opinion about whether there are other options or whether the testing has been adequate. So we're going to get back to this at the end of the session and see what we've learned about how to best manage this patient. Dr. Tafe, do you want to take it from yep. here? Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start the discussion on the molecular testing and just kind of set the stage for the background as to why we do so much molecular diagnostic testing and why it's important. As you can see here in the, the pie chart on the left with lung adenocarcinoma, we know that there are many different gene alterations that we can possibly identify. And this has been an ever-growing list in the last 10 years, really. Um, and the, the tumors that do not have any mutations identified is actually shrinking, becoming smaller and smaller. So, so that's potentially good news for our patients that we have more targets, but also at the same time, we need to do more comprehensive testing so that we're covering all these biomarkers. Um, and as you can see on the table on the right, we do have a number of targets that do have FDA approved drugs for reference. Um, today, we're really going to focus our discussion on fusion testing and specifically use RET um, fusion testing as an example. Um, so RET is a receptor tyrosine kinase, which means it is a transmembrane receptor, very similar to EGFR and HER2, which you may be familiar with. Um, and these have an extracellular domain, a transmembrane domain, and a kinase domain, um, which is intracellular, which is where uh, the activity happens. Um, and the RET is normally expressed in a wide spectrum of tissues, and it forms heterodimers and becomes activated, leading to downstream signal pathway activation, such as the RAS-REF pathway, um, which is very commonly activated by, um, as in EGFR mutations, also activates this pathway, as do several other genes that you're probably familiar with. So gene fusions can lead to activation, as can um, mutations. Um, gene fusions essentially are rearrangements between uh, two different genes, which can be uh, rearrangements between chromosomes, as you can see is an example here on the left, or it can be within a chromosome itself. 
In the normal state in the center, you can see a receptor activation of the pathways, but when we have gene fusion, something different happens a little bit. Um, with the fusion, we have a new partner that is coming in and fusing with RET, and the kinase domain of RET is maintained and because there is um, this new partner, we have constitutive activation of this new fusion protein, which leads to downstream activation um, without requiring that ligand binding um, signal to activate the pathway. And RET alterations are seen across many exons in the gene. Um, and also in several different hereditary cancer syndromes, as you can see here, such as MEN2A and um, hereditary medullary thyroid carcinoma. We, the, these are typically uh, point mutations or small nucleotide variants, um, as opposed to fusions. Um, fusions are, tend to be more of the somatic alterations that we see in different tumor types, as illustrated at the, at the little human diagram on the right. There's a bunch of different fusions that have been described with multiple different partner genes with RET. Um, for lung cancer, we see RET fusions in only a small percentage, 1 to 2 percent, um, but it is becoming a very actionable and targetable alteration that we want to identify for our lung cancer patients. As you can see here, a number of other tumor types have also been described as having these significant RET fusions identified. Um, so the clinical utility is that uh, they are therapeutically targetable, um, which Dr. Pinnell will discuss next. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that there are multiple different fusion partner genes. Um, and this is very important into, as to how we decide um, the best approach to molecular testing for identifying gene fusions. And I'll pass it on to Nate right here for some discussion of the clinical implications of identifying these RET fusions. Oh, thanks, Laura. It, we've actually known that RET fusions were present in a small percentage of lung adenocarcinoma patients for many years, probably a decade at least. I remember finding these on the early NGS reports that were coming out when we were really only looking for uh, epidermal growth factor receptor mutations and ALK gene fusions. Um, there were first-generation multi-kinase TKIs that targeted RET, so drugs like electinib, cabozantinib, lenvatinib, vendatinib. Um, that had some efficacy, but it was kind of disappointing and not particularly well tolerated. And it really was only more recently when the selective RET inhibitors, sulfurcatinib and pralcetinib, came into the scene that we had much more effective and well tolerated options for our patients. Um, and now, of course, sulfurcatinib and pralcetinib are both approved uh, for RET fusion positive non small cell lung cancer, both in adults and pediatric patients for RET fusion positive thyroid cancer patients, for RET mutation positive medullary thyroid cancer patients, and in the case of sulfurcatinib, all solid tumors with RET fusions, uh, which is a, it, kind of moving us towards the tissue agnostic um, period of treatment for cancers, which I think is really interesting. Now I'm just gonna briefly cover exactly how well these drugs work, because um, it really is, is pretty remarkable. The first study that was presented was the Libretto 1 study of sulfurcatinib in both pretreated and treatment naive RET fusion positive non small cell lung cancer patients. Um, this is what we call waterfall plots, where essentially when the lines go down, that means that the cancer got smaller. And you can see that both in the previously treated on the left side of the page uh, with a response rate of 61%, but you can see that almost all of the patients had some clinical benefit. And on the right side of the page for treatment, treatment naive patients, the response rate was 84%, which is extraordinary. And you can see that essentially no one progressed as their best response to these drugs. If you look at the numbers a little more detailed here, you can see that um, the uh, progression-free survivals were in the range of two years, both in treatment naive and previously treated patients, patients which is pretty extraordinary, with overall survivals uh, approaching 60% at three years, which is, is again, quite remarkable for advanced lung cancer patients. Interestingly, also these drugs are active in the CNS for brain metastases, although you can see that the numbers are not quite as impressive with duration of responses um, of approximately 9.4 months. 
The drug also um, is well tolerated compared to some of the older multi-targeted TKIs. Um, patients can commonly get mild edema, uh, fatigue. In particular, patients do complain of dry mouth. Uh, hypertension is a little bit of an off-target effect on the VEGF receptor and occurs in 26% um, of people with uh, more serious hypertension and about 14% of people that can be managed with antihypertensive, as well as rash. And there's a little bit of transaminitis as well that you have to monitor. But overall, patients feel quite good on these, with very few of them needing to discontinue the drug. The second drug to come along was pralcetinib uh, with the ARO study here, so a very similar type of drug. Um, and again, a response rate both in prior treated and uh, treatment naive patients that is in the range of 70%. And for those who are treatment naive, again, 74 to 88%, depending on how they defined eligibility, uh, almost no patients progressing with a duration of response, again, in the range of two years. Very similar patterns of uh, toxicities, although somewhat more um, hematologic toxicities, such as neutropenia and anemia and thrombocytopenia seen with pralcetinib compared to selpercatinib. Similar amount of hypertension uh, with about 11% grade three. Interestingly, these drugs seem to be active if the RET fusion is positive, regardless of what the source of the tumor is. So we're gonna be talking mostly about lung cancer because that's the most common type of patient that we treat with these. But when you have other types of tumors with RET positive, uh, either mutation or fusion positive cancers, uh, drugs like selpercatinib are also quite effective. And in fact, uh, very recently in September of 22, selpercatinib was approved by the FDA based upon um, uh, these results. There are very similar results that have been published with pralcetinib, although uh, it is not yet approved by the FDA for this indication. So as remarkable as these drugs are and as long lasting as they are, unfortunately, they're still not cures and patients do eventually go on to uh, get acquired resistance to the drugs and progress. And we're understanding a lot more about how these things happen. Most of the mechanisms for acquired resistance fall into very consistent patterns. Either there are on-target mutations in the target itself, uh, in which case perhaps a better drug targeting that tyrosine kinase might be effective. But many patients also have so-called bypass signaling, where the oncogenic signaling is taken over by a completely different molecule, in which case a better inhibitor of that target may not actually be effective. You can also have mutations in downstream effectors, um, such as MAP kinase and PI3 kinase uh, partners. And then Rarely, but very importantly, sometimes patients can develop a transformation to a different phenotype, such as small cell carcinoma, that really can only be picked up through a tissue biopsy. There are multiple approaches to treating drug resistance, which we're not gonna cover in much detail. It really depends upon uh, the clinical scenario. For example, for single sites of progression, oftentimes we'll do local therapy, such as radiation, which can eliminate the resistant clones, uh, whereas systemic treatment is needed for broader areas of resistance. Um, with a biopsy to find new alterations, you can target the targetable findings, uh, potentially with a better drug that targets the resistance mechanism, or even perhaps using a combination targeting the bypass pathways. And then finally, if you don't find any targetable mechanisms, you can do um, mechanism agnostic treatments such as chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Uh, we also have antibody drug conjugates, which are not always dependent on biomarkers, which are uh, becoming quite effective. Looking at what we understand about mechanisms of resistance within RET-positive lung cancer, we have both on-target uh, mutations within the RET tyrosine kinase domain, but we also have off-target uh, bypass pathways that have been identified, such as MET amplification and other driver oncogenes, such as KRAS mutations, BRAF mutations, and NTRAC fusions have been described. And so the only way to pick this up, of course, is through a biopsy of um, the patient when they are progressing. This is a cartoon covering all of the different potential ways that people can develop resistance to drugs like selpercatinib and pralcetinib, both on target with uh, the so-called solvent front and gatekeeper mutations, as well as um, bypass pathways. This particular publication covered a couple of patients who were being treated with selpercatinib um, who were followed with plasma um, circulating tumor DNA showing that uh, on this 
uh, cartoon on the left that under treatment with lenvatinib, an older RET inhibitor, there was no emergence of any new RET mutations, but under treatment with salpercatinib, the specific RET inhibitor, we had the emergence of three separate uh, solvent front mutations, um, which have also been found not just in lung cancer, but also in medullary thyroid cancer patients as well. And so clearly this is a, um, a specific mechanism of resistance that will need to be addressed. There are a number of next generation RET inhibitors that are in clinical development, uh, which are listed here. Uh, but unfortunately, none of them really have any clinical data yet that we can cover. But uh, lots going on in this field. Second part of our talk today is covering some of the gaps uh, that are out there. Now that we've demonstrated how important it is to identify patients with um, RET fusions and other rare alterations, how well are we doing in actually identifying patients for these today? There are a few publications that have covered um, molecular testing for these patients. Um, the first was the Mylung Consortium, which went through 2020, showing that we actually do okay for testing for older targets like EGFR, ALK, and ROS1. Uh, 70 to 75% of patients were, were tested in this cohort of patients. However, once we get beyond the first three, you can see that we're getting down to fewer than 50% of patients being tested for all five of, at that time, the guideline uh, directed targets, including PDL1, and only 37 to 39% uh, of patients being tested uh, with NGS, which would cover all of the targets that we need today. In a larger series from the Flatiron um, uh, Electronic Health uh, Record Database, uh, in a recent publication at, uh, and presentation at ASCO last year, uh, Dr. Bruno and colleagues demonstrated that uh, while, again, about 85% of people had some testing of non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, NGS was really only being done about half the time at 53% with some disparities showing that uh, black patients were, were tested less frequently. But importantly, only about 30 to 36% of people were being tested prior to the initiation of first-line treatment with NGS, which is uh, extremely disappointing because uh, that would not cover uh, all of the targets for which we have effective treatments. I, I thought it was really interesting that there's a publication that basically took us through all the different steps where things can go wrong in testing. Uh, Laura, you wanna uh, take us through some of, of how we are missing these patients? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this was a really interesting um, study going through a large database of, of claims data and also laboratory data. Um, and they kind of condensed all these, all their findings into seven big kind of practice gaps that they identified. Um, they normalized this to represent approximately, to represent a thousand lung cancer patients that could have been eligible for um, targeted therapy. So that is the, the the number that you're seeing as their starting point here in the, the large circle plots. Um, and they identified different areas at which uh, there are pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic concerns. Um, the first practice gap they identified was that the a bi that biopsy referral was not even made um, for a number of patients, and so tissue was never obtained um, from them initially uh, before they started a therapy, it seems. Um, which is a little bit of a concern that there was perhaps um, not enough material actually harvested for diagnostic purposes from a biopsy. Um, the second practice gap came into the process of actually uh, collecting the biopsy and having inadequate specimen collected at the time of, of identifying at the time of the procedure. Um, and some, uh, some options to remedy this are things that I'll talk about um, along the way too, as well as some of the other pre-analytic issues. Um, the third was that uh, specimens uh, after initial diagnosis were no longer um, had enough tissue available for ancillary testing or the biomarker testing. And um, subsequently after um, biomarker testing was actually ordered on some patients. It was not ordered an appropriate amount of time for them to be able to receive therapy uh, before um, with the targeted therapy before they started that initial therapy, as, as Dr. Pennell just alluded to. 
And at this point as well, there's often many cases that um, the quality or the quantity or the quality was not sufficient for further testing. And um, some of this actually has to do with, um, as pathologists, we do our very best to identify the best specimens available. But as you cut more through the tissue block, you lose tissue. Um, and our adequacy assessment um, can potentially not be 100% because of background contaminating cells. So it can be underestimated potentially rather than, um, and so there is insufficient amount of tissue available. The um, fifth practice gap was at the point of biomarker testing, some um, specimens might have passed the initial QC steps, but then after going through the analysis, they perhaps did not have sufficient amount of DNA or RNA extracted, or they failed sequencing an an analysis. And the six steps were some um, some concerns about testing, timing of testing, um, so that potentially results were not back when spe- the patient needed to be treated. Um, and this can also be a concern when a patient is referred to another institution that all that information isn't necessarily coming along with the patient as, as quickly as needs to be or the, the testing workup wasn't as complete as is needed. And finally, the the seventh practice gap was actually um, patients who do have all the appropriate testing done, uh, but treatment decisions were um, not not appropriate. So uh, the opportunity to uh, prescribe biomarker associated therapeutics were were missed essentially. And and that's a a fairly large percentage of patients, about um, 29% of patients. And I don't know, Dr. Pinnell, if you wanted to make any comments about some of the things you see as being um, challenges around that particular point for getting the patients the drug once you finally have all the testing. Yeah, I see this in practice all the time. Patients either uh, may start treatment before the testing is complete, and then you know you try to keep it in the back of your mind that you eventually want to remember to do that. But patients with lung cancer get sick and don't always have the opportunity to move to the subsequent treatment. Um, sometimes it just gets missed through lack of education. Uh, patients, um, you know, n- new drugs that come out. Uh, People are still using older older drugs, and they're not aware of what's available. Um, so it, it's it's uh, and then of course there are disparities and issues with actually obtaining drugs uh, in many parts of the world. A lot of these targeted drugs are not available at all, and even within the United States, many patients can't afford them uh, because of uh, financial issues and insurance coverage. So uh, lots of lots of reasons why people may fail to get the drugs that may benefit them. Yeah, definitely. A lot, of, a lot of areas for improvement overall as well. Um, I'm, I'm going to, after that, I'm going to move on and, and talk a little bit more about the, the realities of biomarker testing focused on the fusion testing. Um, and it's, it's so important, as, as I'm sure you already grasped, that proper biomarker testing is important for, for many reasons. Um, It definitely optimizes care and the timing of particular uh, sequence of particular therapies, potentially. It gives us information about the biology of the tumor as well. Um, It allows for prognostic information and guides therapy, um, both targeted therapy and also informs when to use or when not to use immunotherapy. And the types of tissue do, does matter. Um, we have you know, tissue testing, and we also have the potential to use a blood sample, um, which is called a liquid biopsy. And there are many different types of testing approaches. Um, for many years, we use single gene assays, which are testing essentially one target at a time. Um, when many of our laboratories have moved to more multiplex testing, particularly to next generation sequencing or NGS testing. Um, and then for fusion testing, we really do need to think about are we doing a DNA versus an RNA based approach? Um, and that's an important decision making um, feature for choosing a, an actual test. Um, just to reiterate and remind us that we now have an ever growing list of biomarkers that we absolutely have to um, test for. And these are really the very, very bare minimum that is required for molecular diagnostic testing. Um, PDL1 immunohist- is an immunohistochemistry assay, so that also has to be performed as an ancillary test after the, the uh, diagnosis is made. And this to get to the um, 
actual byproduct of a molecular pathology report, there are many steps that have to happen that require a truly interdisciplinary communication and teamwork um, to get the patient to the actual point of, of having receiving a biopsy. Um, and this sometimes, this is often ordered by an oncologist. Um, I've also seen patients refer to pulmonologists or thoracic surgeons who are the first um, first physicians to interact with a, a lung cancer patient with a new diagnosis. Um, and we do, at that point, they go on to actually have the biopsy, which can be, um, many times it's a either a cytology-based fine needle aspiration specimen and or a core needle biopsy, so relatively small amounts of tissues are selected or are taken as a biopsy specimen. Um, and then from there, from the biopsy, um, it comes to us in pathology, where our role is to make a diagnosis and to actually direct the ancillary testing that is necessary for a particular tumor type. Um, the molecular diagnostic laboratory um, then is the, the laboratory which is extracting the nucleic acids and performing the assay and reporting those molecular results, which go back and become incorporated in the patient's medical record and returns to the oncologist finally closing that gap so that um, the next decision can, can happen for the patient's care. So from our perspective in pathology, our priority is to um, utilize this usually very small tissue sample at the time of that happens at the that we receive after the biopsy to establish the diagnosis of malignancy, um, then to also classify the tumor, which sometimes requires immunohistochemistry, um, which looks for expression of different markers to phenotype the tumor, um, such as make, calling it an adenocarcinoma versus a squamous cell carcinoma versus a small cell carcinoma. Um, we can utilize immunohistochemistry to come to a further classification. Um, and then pathologists are really kind of the gatekeepers of the tissue. So um, in, in addition to making a diagnosis, we also need to direct the ancillary testing. And in my particular laboratory, for lung cancers, uh, the molecular testing is ordered by the pathologist at the time of diagnosis. Um, subsequently, many institutions have to decide where, to, where are they doing their testing. Um, are they testing in-house? or are they needing to send out to a reference laboratory? And there are a number of factors that are, need to be considered in order to make this decision, um, such as what, what facilities, what laboratory um, capabilities do you have in-house, what's the turnaround time that you require, and um, the cost and billing and the type of specimen. Um, also, in some instances, uh, the type of assay that is required is, is necessary to know. Um, such that tissue testing potentially can be done in-house, but liquid biopsy needs to be sent out because the, the laboratory doesn't offer it at this time. Um, that's just an example that sometimes we need to utilize both in-house and um, send out reference lab assays. So the big thing, one of the big things we worry about in pathology is, is the best specimen handling practices. And um, fortunately, uh, we can do a lot with very little. Um, so we utilize either you know, the biopsy specimen, um, resection specimens, and really any of these cytology specimens are very useful, either the cell blocks and sometimes even smear preparations on the glass slides. The fixation and processing is really important. So FFPE is, is fixed in buffered formalin. Uh, cytology specimens preserved with alcohol-based um, fixatives are really excellent at preserving nucleic acids. Um, and also to be aware of decalcification. Um, strong, acid, strong acid decalcifiers really de degrade your nucleic acids um, versus EDTA. So uh, in, in, our, in my institution, our gross room has a policy that if they receive a biopsy from any metastatic site um, that is bone, they will decalcify the specimen in EDTA. So it's a, it's a specific protocol in this situation to preserve the nucleic acids. It might take a, a day or two longer, um, but it preserves the nucleic acids so that we can do molecular analysis off of that tissue. Um, there are also concerns about the sample sectioning, such as refacing the blocks to cut immunohistochemistries and then go back for molecular testing. Um, and so all those all those steps kind of need to be thought through in order to best preserve tissue.
Another thing to keep in mind is the concept of heterogeneity. Um, so there is both tissue heterogeneity and there's tumor heterogeneity. And tissue heterogeneity means that your tumor tissue is not 100% tumor cells. There's always these background contaminating normal stromal cells and inflammatory cells. And so um, one of our roles as pathologists is to make an assessment as to uh, what, how, what is the percentage of tumor in this particular particular area um, so that we can essentially enrich for the tumor content, content um, for extraction of the nucleic acids and, and try to um, get as much pure tumor as we can. So um, in our laboratory, for instance, our minimum tumor cellularity, um, which was established during the validation of our next-gen sequencing assay is 10%. Um, so we need to have at least 10% tumor content. Some laboratories have higher up to 20 or so percent in order to do NGS assays. And that assessment needs to happen before it goes on to testing. And then second, the, talk of the concept of tumor heterogeneity is that genetically a tumor might contain multiple different clones with different mutational profiles. Um, and this especially becomes relevant in the context of resistance or recurrent metastatic disease, where um, different metastatic sites might actually become driven by different, um, different gene alterations. And so potentially um, you either may need require my multiple biopsies, or this is also an opportunity to use a liquid biopsy to get more of a profile overall of, of what's happening um, with multiple metastatic sites. Um, as I've already strongly alluded to, pathologist assessment is incredibly important. Um, what we do is look at an, a representative H&E slide, which is paired at the time, um, which is performed at the time of the uh, unstained slides being cut. Um, we look at a representative slide to look for adequacy and also to circle areas of tumor content that we would like to have extracted for testing. Um, it's really important to note that not all laboratories have pathologists that evaluate specimens as they arrive. And this is particularly true for some of the um, send out laboratories. So if you do require send out testing, um, it is an important question to ask if they do have a pathologist that is able to do an adequacy assessment um, so, that they, uh, so that you are not actually having false negative results from your tests. Um, and as I said too, to achieve this analytic sensitivity, we do typically macro dissection to enrich for the tumor content. Um, and so another thing we have to think about as we select different types of testing is what are, what are we actually testing for? Um, so for RET, for instance, there are the gene rearrangements or fusions that we're looking for. Um, and also we've also talked a little bit about in some instances there are um, point mutations, so a different type of mutation than the, the gene rearrangements or fusions. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that not all tests are able to detect all different types of these alterations. Um, and that was more true a while ago. Um, it's getting better that pretty much if you're doing a, a comprehensive NGS assay, it will be able to um, detect all of these different types of, re of alterations. Um, this is just a, a schema of cytology preparation. Um, if you need to be reminded, there are two opportunities really to use path um, cytology specimens for molecular testing. One is at the top where we have direct smears. Sometimes we'll have, um, if we are absolutely desperate, sometimes we'll go to the direct smears and um, actually scrape off the tissue for testing. Um, this does need to be validated in a, in a laboratory in order to do this. And then secondly, um, if you follow the left side, the, um, the cytology specimen is typically spun down and a cell block is made, which is, is FFPE fixed and embedded in paraffin. And um, this gets treated just like every other FFPE where you have H&E &E and unstained slides you can cut from this and utilize for molecular testing too. Um, there can be quite a few variables in, in terms of specimen adequacy, and one way to help deal with that is to, particularly for the cytology specimens, is to utilize uh, the rapid on-site evaluation or assessment, which is called ROSE. Um, and in this con how this works is that a um, pathologist or a pa uh, pathology or cytotechnologist will go 
and be at the bedside in order to do a quick evaluation of the, of the material that is collected to see if it is adequate for molecular testing. Um, there are differences in the adequacy of FNAs versus CT-guided needle biopsies. Um, sometimes the CT-guided biopsies might actually have less tumor content than an FNA, um, and that's because some of the stroma of the tumor um, might not lend as much to having a good content of, of tumor. It might be more fibrotic, for instance. Um, and we already mentioned some of the tissue processing factors that can lead to um, inadequate specimens. Um, just walking through a couple of different approaches to how laboratories have approached this question of increasing adequacy. Um, this is a protocol that is in my institution that we established a few years ago um, that after a, uh, that a specimen is evaluated by rose assessment by a, a cytopathologist, if they deem it to be adequate and um, suspicious for uh, lung cancer, uh, particularly non-small cell lung cancer, they will put in an order for histology to cut um, a series of unstained slides up front at the time that the block is originally cut. So we'll have an H&E and then a series of unstained slides, which can be utilized for the IHC for diagnosis purpose purposes, as well as for um, subsequent molecular testing. And uh, this has been a great protocol for us, which has dramatically decreased the number of quantity not sufficient FNA specimens in our lab. Um, another approach is to separate biopsy pieces into different blocks so that you're um, potentially have one block that you can utilize for diagnosis and the other you can utilize for ancillary testing. And um, some laboratories are also as also being creative with this leftover cytology fluid, the supernatant that, that's left over, uh, potentially still has cells in it or um, cell-free DNA, another, another context of cell-free DNA, which could be extracted from the residual cytology fluid and also use, utilized for molecular testing. Um, so that is yet another approach to getting, getting to the answer. Um, a big, I think a big conversation that has to happen at every institution is between particularly the pathologist and the oncologist team. Teams are if the pathologist is going to be order reflex testing or if we're going to wait and have the oncologist initiate testing. Um, in my institution uh, for lung cancer, uh, we've decided that the pathologist will do reflexive ordering at the time of diagnosis. And this is because this, this can decrease um, decreased turnaround times, and we have the specimen right there in front of us at the time of diagnosis, and we can pick exactly what would be the best specimen to test. So this kind of makes the whole process a little bit more succinct for us. Um, alternatively, you can have oncologist-driven testing, which is what we utilize for other tumor types that are not lung cancer. Um, and you know there are definitely strengths of the oncologist knows what's already been done and what questions they need most urgently answered. Um, so this is also an approach that an institution can take. But like I said, I think this is a really key component to um, having to establishing a protocol for your institution as to how to approach this. Looking for deciding on what molecular tests to utilize and also <clears throat> What are the features that we look for for our molecular assays? Um, there's two main ones. We have the clinical sensitivity and the analytic sensitivity. And essentially what um, the clinical sensitivity means is what is your test designed to evaluate? So is your test designed to only cover SNVs and indels, or can it also detect copy number variants and gene fusion? So those are questions that um, will help you decide how to pick the best test. What, it, what is its coverage? What is it designed to interrogate? And then on the analytic side, side is what we, this analytic sensitivity is what we establish during our um, validation in the clinical laboratory, which is really looking at um, questions like, what is the minimum tumor content we need to have good test results that we are confident in? Um, and these are um, described as like the lower limit of detection of our particular assays so that um, we can 
minimize the number of potential false negatives. Essentially, we don't want any, um, but this is a, a method that we establish a baseline for our clinical laboratories as to how, how low we're able to go to get confident results. Um, some options to consider about um, gene fusion testing. Um, traditionally, we've utilized some of the assays such as FISH or RT-PCR analysis, um, but more and more we're utilizing next-gen sequencing assays. And um, there are different approaches in terms of NGS assays as to um, using what starting material you start with, either RNA or DNA. Um, and this table just summarizes specifically for RET, um, some of the strengths and weaknesses of these different approaches. And just to briefly summarize, essentially, immunohistochemistry is not recommended. Um, it, IHC is something we do utilize for ALK fusion, <clears throat> fusion detection occasionally, um, but IHC for RET is not recommended. IHC for FISH in general is not recommended because there can be high false positives and false negatives for a couple of different reasons. Um, and RT-PCR, um, while it's a very powerful tool, you need to know both genes that you're trying to identify. So discovering novel fusions um, in cases like uh, RET, for instance, we've talked about all the different possible fusion partner genes, an RT-PCR assay would be, need to be designed to detect every single one of those in order to cover everything. Um, and then we have the next-gen sequencing assays, which um, we'll talk a little bit about mo more about DNA versus RNA, um, but these are really the approaches most laboratories are going for right now. And so why does it matter, um, particularly for RET fusions? Well, RET gene is on chromosome 10, and this little illustration, the red boxes that came up, illustrates that many of the rearrangements in with RET have to do with um, very within the chromosome. Um, so this schematic uh, illustrates the detection of a, or the design of a fish assay. Um, so as I just said, a lot of the gene rearrangements for the RET are actual inversions. And um, looking at the two probes, saying that we are flanking the breakpoint in the RET gene um, with these red and orange probes, um, actually with the rearrangement, you can see that these probes are still very close together. There really is not good separation of these um, to actually give you that really visual separation on your fish signal. So this can lead to a false negative result by fish. So that's an important thing to, to keep in mind that that might not be the best um, approach to testing for RET fusions. Um, in addition, uh, DNA-based testing for fusions can be really challenging. It, it, your DNA assay has to be able to read into introns and be really designed specifically for fusion detection. And um, most, most many of the DNA-based NGS assays that uh, initially were, were available, um, and some of them still are not specifically designed to detect for all these different possible gene fusion events. Um, and so many laboratories are headed more towards a um, RNA-based detection. In addition, some fusions are a little, some gene fusions can be a little bit more easily identified, such as ELK and RET, where other gene fusions can be more challenging to ident be identified um, because, because of um, how they're actually how they're actually formed, oftentimes with challenging reads into the introns, and you can see these genes here. So really one of the benefits of using RNA analysis is that you're really looking to detect what is actually expressed. And so after the fusion has happened, you're looking to see, to look, to identify the RNA product of the gene fusion. So all the, um, all the intervening introns have been spliced out and you're just left with the, the exon material to evaluate. Um, which can be a little bit easier to, to de detect the fusion that is, and you also know that it's truly expressed in your tumor. Um, this is an example of a uh, RNA-based fusion detection from my laboratory. Looking at the IGV plots, each one of these lines indicates a read um, through the gene, and um, the, on the very bottom, you can see the, the darker blue um, 
letters, lit up letters, actually define where the gene fusion breakpoints are for this particular uh, fusion. So these are very pretty to look at. And um, as molecular pathologists, we really enjoy these. <laughs> um, RNA sequencing has been repeatedly shown to be a, a very valuable um, and very high yield for molecular testing for gene fusions. This was a study out of um, MSK, Memorial Sloan Kettering, a couple of years ago, where they looked at uh, about um, 589 cancer patients who had previously been tested on only DNA-based assay and were negative for all drivers. On subsequent RNA testing, they identified um, another 15% of tumors which actually did harbor a gene fusion. And so the, the yield was quite substantial in using this RNA-based approach. Um, so again, I, this is kind of the preferred approach that we're going towards. Um, you, this is just a comparison between different types of next-gen sequencing, um, DNA-based hybrid capture versus RNA-based amplicon and some of the other RNA-based assays, such as the hybrid capture, the anchored multiplex. Um, the third option here is really, is really the best and becoming what many laboratories are approaching with uh, for identifying gene fusions, particularly some of the, the genes that have very challenging fusions to detect. Another strength of these assays is that they can identify novel partner genes, which is um, very powerful because we keep Every, like every week in the literature, there's a new gene fusion that's been described um, that we, we need to be able to test for. And so it's, it's helpful to have these very flexible assays in order to do that. Um, just to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about the liquid biopsy and, and how it can potentially be utilized. Um, so liquid biopsy is to identify a tumor, specifically tumor DNA that has been shed into the bloodstream. And uh, oftentimes this is because it's, the cells have died, perhaps under treatment or radiation therapy, and um, then they, they lyse and release their DNA into the circulation. Um, we are able to use a blood tube to collect the, and the blood and separate out the plasma and actually do a DNA extraction to isolate out these nucleic acids and can use very sensitive techniques in order to do mutation analysis on this, this uh, ctDNA. Some of the potential applications of liquid biopsies are to identify prognostic um, markers or prognostic biomarkers, um, also the therapeutic targets and monitor response to therapy over time. It's much less invasive and so multiple um, blood draws are much easier to do than multiple biopsies over a long period of time. They're also very important tools to help us identify resistance mutations um, and to repeat tissue biopsy um, at, a frequent, at a frequent event. They may also provide some faster turnaround time. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, be a nice way to see what the tumor is doing across a patient's body, particularly if there are multiple metastatic sites that can get information uh, more readily from, from kind of this pool of tumor, tissue, tumor DNA that's circulating. There are some caveats to ctDNA analysis though. They can have false negative results. Um, the sensitivity is only about 70 to 80% and actually that drops for fusion detection. Um, and that's because most of these are DNA-based assays rather than RNA-based assays. And so they do have the challenges with some fusion detection. Um, there also is no way to, ad to assess adequacy um, as in FFPE, so there's um, not really a great way to know that you do have enough tumor content uh, or tumor DNA content in order to um, successfully and confidently call alterations. So how do you handle a negative result on a liquid biopsy when there's still a very high suspicion that the, the tumor might have a driver alteration? Um, at that point, you really do need to get tissue in order to test for further. Um, this is a, a proposal for how you can approach utilizing ctDNA testing. Um, on the top row, we can see that if tumor testing is available, that's, that's really the preferred mechanism of testing right now, but there are um, alternatives to use for using ctDNA analysis, such as if the tissue is inadequate, um, 
you can do that in parallel with tissue testing, or if from the start the tissue is inadequate, you can add the ctDNA analysis uh, for relatively rapid genotyping um, information. So in summary for this section on um, detecting fusions and gene testing approaches in the clinical laboratory, um, it's really important that we utilize testing early and test often. Um, particularly if a patient has recurrence of disease, we probably need to get more information about what that tumor is doing. Um, this is a very complex system and requires a lot of communication between all different participants in terms of um, the oncologists, the, the physicians performing the biopsies, um, the pathologists who are directing the tissue usage as well. Um, communication is really key uh, across all avenues of patient care, um, particularly around biomarker testing and um, doing this very successfully within, within a system. I do want to refer you to a, a nice publication that recently came out about practice considerations related to non-small cell lung cancer testing. Um, and this, this particular publication focuses um, nicely on RET fusion testing and reiterates a lot of the information I've already provided for you today. Um, and also draw your attention to the box down here that um, there is also available supplemental practice aids for biomarker testing, which are provided by PeerView. Essentially, to, to summarize some of the, the strengths and weaknesses and some of the challenges that we face with biomarker testing, just to kind of circle back on some of these gaps, um, I'm going to ask Dr. Pennell to join me here a little bit in this, this discussion. Um, in terms of what, what do you see and have you experienced in your practice as being, being some of the common gaps that you face, particularly possibly to those in the community setting, and, and what are some ideas you have for, for, for fixing that? <laughs> what are some of the solutions we can utilize um, with our colleagues in order to do better? Yeah, it's, uh, it's challenging. Um, back when we were really just looking for EGFR and ALK, you know, we, we've gotten to the point where, where almost everyone was testing for these consistently and doing it rapidly. But now that we've expanded to NGS, I feel like we've taken some steps back and it's just become a lot more complicated. Um, at my own institution, uh, we also use reflex testing for biomarkers. So our pathologists actually order at the time of diagnosis. And while there are some disadvantages to that, such as the potential for some redundant uh, testing on, on samples, although they, they do check within the EMR to make sure that nothing has already been tested. Um, this really speeds up the process of getting this information because I, I do want to point out that we, we need this for initial treatment decisions on potentially sick people. And so uh, speed actually is pretty important. But a lot of the patients that I see get their um, biopsies somewhere else, and uh, there's just a wide range of what kind of testing practices are there. I, would, I think most places probably the oncologist is still the one who's ordering it, and then it depends on who the vendor that their lab uh, partners with, uh, which you know often takes a few weeks to get the slides sent and then to get the results. And it can be difficult for anyone but the ordering practitioner to get access to that. So oftentimes, I don't actually have access to the tissue uh, testing results uh, until the patient themselves calls me and lets me know that someone called them with that. I, I do think that liquid testing uh, is really helpful for, for this because it's something that can be done really quickly um, on, on any patient while you wait for this. Uh, but I really wish there was a better kind of central way to access tissue testing results for everyone. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's challenging within our own institution sometimes too. Um, I know just how things are reported in the medical record systems can be variable. Um, sometimes the results go back to the physician who, like the interventional radiologist who actually performed the biopsy. And so the oncologist has to, um, isn't necessarily the first to be notified that the results are even available. And I, I can imagine that that can be, be frustrating and cause a delay as well. Um, in terms of um, in terms of having all that information available when you are actually seeing your patients, so and yes. yeah, sometimes even uh, reading the reports can be challenging because oftentimes they're sort of addended mm -hmm. 
you know, a couple weeks after the initial report, they're just kind of indented to the end of the PATH report, and you have to kind of be able to find that. Find where the where the reports file, um, and if they're coming from an outside, they might file in a different place, and if they're coming from the inside institution, um, and they're they're really every institution has a very has their own kind of format for reporting, so it's not. I think that is one challenge that we face in molecular diagnostics is how to harmonize reporting a little bit so that all the information that, that you as the oncologist need is, is really well articulated and upfront because um, the reports can be very long with all the information that we, we think we need to include um, that may or may not be utilized. But, but that is something in terms of reporting that we could all probably do a little bit better at too. One of the things that I think can be very helpful is establishing um, so-called molecular tumor boards where mm -hmm. all of the reports are centrally kind of reviewed by a group of people who are familiar with reviewing, you know, results that can yeah. highlight and, you know, reach out to the ordering practitioners with their interpretation of what they mean, what the best potential treatment would be, or potentially even clinical trial options for these patients. Yeah, is, is do you, we have a molecular tumor board as well? Would would you care to share a few more words about how yours is structured, and I'll talk about mine too. For um, now, it doesn't apply for all the basic uh, testing for our lung cancer patients, but for all of testing outside of lung cancer that comes through larger um, NGS panels, they do come to. Uh, we actually have a, a genomic coordinator who basically gets all of these reports, and then on a weekly basis, they review these at a, um, a meeting with, uh, based upon the type tumor types, they get uh, practitioners from each of those subtypes to come to help review the reports and discuss uh, what the clinical data is for treating people with those alterations, and then also to review the selection of clinical trials that are available um, within, in our case, driving distance of Ohio. Yeah, yeah. Um, ours is ours is slightly similar, a little bit different. Um, we do have uh, actually, it's myself and, and another colleague who reviews all the NGS um, reports as they come out of the laboratory. The ones that have clear FDA approval, we usually think that the treating oncologist knows how to approach those, and so a lot of our tumor board is focused on. Um, potentially driving or identifying clinical trials that a patient might be eligible for without the obvious um, FDA approved targets. So that's, that's how ours is working. And actually I, uh, an underappreciated benefit of this is, is uh, many of these commercial reports also potentially recommend inappropriate treatments uh, that have already been tested in clinical trials and have been shown to not be beneficial, but they'll still right. based upon purely the pathway recommend potential off-label use uh, that is not always appropriate. And so really you get both positive and negative curation from your molecular tumor board. Yeah, exactly. And another thing that we've found very helpful with the molecular tumor board is we also highlight, we do tumor only testing, so we don't have a, a germline <laughs> subtraction. Um, so we are also able to identify patients that should be followed up with genetic counselors um, for possible germline testing. Um, for themselves and potentially for their family too. So that's been another, I think, valuable contribution of our molecular tumor board too. Yeah, excellent point. Um, so finally, we are approaching module two, um, where we're gonna discuss our case a little bit further in more detail. Yeah, so we discussed this at the beginning and we'll review it briefly again. This is a 63-year-old male non-smoker. Uh, who has a persistent cough, is found to have a left lung nodule, which on further imaging uh, is a uh, left lung three centimeter nodule with enlarged, with enlarged mediastinal nodes, as well as liver and uh, bone lesions that indicate metastatic disease. Now, um, all of the lesions, whether they're in the liver, in the bone, or in the lungs, are potentially amenable to biopsy. And this is a scenario where the oncologist and the pathologist typically aren't involved in the decision making on how to obtain the tissue. But if you could, Laura, if you could be part of the decision making team to try to figure out where, does it matter? Does it matter if they get a bone biopsy, if they have the potential to get a liver biopsy or a lung biopsy? Does it matter if it's a lymph node versus the tumor? And do you care if they get a core biopsy versus an FNA? Um, those are all questions and not all have perfect answers to them. <laughs> um, 
I think we would prefer not to have the bone um, lesions if possible because of some of the decalcification issues. Uh, the liver is, is totally fine and so is the primary tumor or the, or the lymph nodes. Um, I, I'm assuming at this point, also I guess we need to know where the treatment this patient is. So if they have not seen any targeted or any therapies, um, any, I think any tumor is more, whatever is most accessible is probably the easiest to evaluate. If they have in the scenario, if it were different and they had, um, they had a new liver lesion after they had received a therapy, potentially the growing liver metastasis would be what we will want to find out more about because that seems to be the more active concern. But um, we get both we get both mixtures of core biopsies and cytology specimens, and both are very well utilized. I think um, FNAs might be even slightly better than core biopsies in terms of their performance for the molecular testing, and that's because FNAs, just the nature of aspirating a tumor, um, get tend to get more cells, I think, overall in proportion to the background kind of stroma and, and other contaminating tissue that might challenge the molecular testing. So that's my, that's my take. No, I think it's an excellent point. And I think the, the message is, you know, the, whatever your institution has a best expertise in and what's most amenable for the patient and safest for the patient is probably where you should go. At our institution, we have an extremely large and active interventional pulmonary team. So most of our diagnoses are actually made bronchoscopically with endobronchial ultrasound. But by communicating with them, they know if it's a lung cancer patient that they have to get lots of material so that we have enough for biomarker testing and not just a single pass of an FNA. Um, yeah. Are there any other aspects of the biopsy that might help um, to make sure that you're getting adequate tissue? Yeah, I think, um, so if this was a new diagnosis and the patient did not have the metastasis, I think one of the goals of doing the biopsy, such as the endoscopic biopsies, is to um, sample regional lymph nodes in order to do the staging. Um, so I think that's one approach is at the time of biopsy, to get the most information you can in terms of staging the patient too. And then um, in terms of specimens coming to the laboratory, um, our, our, the workflow can be split. So some specimens can go to cytology, such as the FNAs and um, tissue associated with that procedure, and then core biopsies might go to the lung pathologist. And so uh, one of the things we do oftentimes, we're comparing our tissues um, with the cytopathologist, as well as asking each other who has the most tumor, who has the best tissue sample that we can push on to molecular testing. So I think that's also important, that conversation even just between our pathologists to optimize tissue testing. Yeah, no, we have, um, one of the things our, our interventional group does is uh, they also have rapid onsite um, evaluation or rows that helps make sure that they have enough tissue before they let the patient up off the table. And then they do get separate um, pathology samples that they send that we use for PDL one testing that we can keep our cytology specimen for the molecular. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, here's an example of the patient's CT scan showing the liver and lung areas for uh, potential biopsies. You can see both of these are pretty easily accessible. Uh, the patient has an FNA um, of the lung lesion, which shows adenocarcinoma, that is TTF1 positive. Uh, as often happens, the PDL1 testing is done first uh, and is reported to be high at 80%. Uh, using the 22C3 uh, FDA-approved uh, companion diagnostic. And then in this case, uh, a panel of uh, so-called hotspot panel is done, uh, which shows that EGFR, BRAF, and KRAS uh, PCR tests are negative. Um, immunohistochemical testing for ALK is negative, and then a uh, FISH to look for ROS1 uh, is done. However, um, this is all the information that is available at the time uh, based on the PDL1, the local oncologist recommended starting on pembrolizumab, and the patient's now coming to us uh, with this information to help decide this. So I guess if, if um, you're looking at this report as a pathologist, would you consider this to be adequate for testing? Um, 
Um, I would not consider it to be adequate for molecular testing for the reasons we've discussed here today. <laughs> this does not cover all of the um, known actionable alterations that do have an approved therapeutic attached to them, um, as well as just giving us um, just giving us a more comprehensive view of, of what's going on too. Um, how about for you? Is this what do you do when you see this? <laughs> as being I know. Common? I wish I could say that this is uncommon, but um, you know, some some mishmash of some testing results being available and some unavailable is relatively common. Um, and then we have to decide what to do. I think it's really interesting um, to think about how patients can advocate for themselves in this scenario as well when they're told that there's a recommended treatment for them and how they can know that they actually have everything done that is necessary. And I, there are lots of uh, resources uh, online, uh, patient communities through organizations such as Longevity, um, Cancer.net from the American Society of Clinical Oncology can provide a lot of uh, patient-facing uh, advice and materials. And then there's online communities of different uh, genetic alteration positive lung cancer patients that uh, also uh, provide a lot of advice online. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I don't. I, I've heard some pathologists uh, talk about having like consults with patients. Are there? Do you think that there's a role for the pathologist in advocating for patients with lung cancer? I, I mean, I, I think it would be wonderful to have more pathologists and patients interacting in that in the context of evaluating their pathology. And I hope we see more of that over time. Um, I think. As pathologists, we, we are clinicians, we are um, very vested in the care of the patient and we do have access to the, the tissue. So one of the, the biggest things we can do is to direct the usage of that, of that tissue, um, such as setting up protocols that optimize how it is treated and processed and treated and handled and gets to the appropriate testing um, performed on it. So I think, I think that's a, a main way that pathologists can advocate for our lung cancer patients. Um, is, is really playing an active role in, in setting up those institutional protocols that optimize tissue usage and acquisition. So one of the things that I would immediately do in this patient is we would obtain their biopsy material and we would have our own pathologist review it and say, you know, can you do more extensive testing? Here that we, we off, that is often the scenario that the uh, prior outside biopsy or pathology material will come to us for re-review and uh, we can confirm the diagnosis and then we are asked the question, is there enough tissue to complete the molecular testing in, in this particular scenario? And unfortunately, oftentimes there is not, and that's because um, with just the PCR assays, the IHC and the FISH that were performed, um, you're using up a lot, of, a lot of tissue that potentially was done sequentially, um, which means that each time that a new test is ordered, the tissue block was refaced and recut potentially losing a lot of that tumor tissue. So often after about four or five um, different single gene assays, which require its own extraction um, or, and or the fish analysis too, which requires um, two slides or so, um, many times there's not enough tissue left at this point, having already had somewhat of a workup done. So unfortunately, many times that question to us will be, no, we don't have enough residual tissue to order the molecular testing on this, on this outside case. So that sort of leaves us with the choice of either treating the patient with the information we have, um, sending them for a new biopsy, or what we will often do is, in this case, send a liquid biopsy or plasma ctDNA test, which, of course, patients there we have access to their blood and usually we can get results within about a week. And in this case, the patient uh, did have a test which showed the CCD C6 RET fusion. Um, so we didn't do this on tissue. Can we be confident with this result? Assuming this is a, you know, in a, a big commercial, you know, certified vendor, uh, that this is a real finding? Um, yes, I think I think you can be confident in the results. Um, these are clinically certified laboratories that, that have gone through their own validation before they're running patient samples, um, and you do have a positive result. So if if the scenario was that the ctDNA came back as negative, um, and you still have this incomplete profile of dr possible driver alterations. I would say in that scenario, you probably still need to go on and get tissue in order to confirm this negative finding 
Um, but in this context, the ctDNA testing did identify a, um, the nice ret fusion that's very targetable, and we don't necessarily need to confirm that with with additional testing or RNA analysis. That's that's an adequate test. And so in this case, uh, based on this, the patient was then uh, treated with selpercatinib, the um, selective RET inhibitor. They tolerated it pretty well with some dry mouth, some mild hypertension that was treated with antihypertensive, uh, a little bit of peripheral edema that didn't require any medical management, um, and had a very nice response that lasted about 18 months before showing uh, progression within a lesion in the liver. And so what options would we do at this point? Um, and I would say uh, at this point it becomes complicated and probably the most important thing is to obtain a biopsy of this uh, progressing lesion so that we can try to find out what's changed in this patient. Yeah, that's a good point to look for um, resistance mutations, right? Right, so unfortunately, you know, uh, drugs targeting resistance mutations are still only available as part of clinical trials, but these are available um, to patients at academic centers uh, around the country. There are half a dozen different uh, next generation RET drugs that are in clinical trials at this point. And there are times where you find targetable um, driver oncogenes that are, that are new, such as the one described with the NTRAC uh, fusion. So I hope today uh, we have helped you achieve a better understanding of the role of gene fusions and less common alterations in lung cancer, as well as the therapies that can be used to target them. Um, illustrated the importance of collaboration and workflows between pathologists, oncologists, and, and the team members to help facilitate biomarker testing. It's really not as simple as it seems. Uh, and once you finally look behind the, uh, the curtain to see what's going on and uh, really we all want to work together to establish best practices so that every patient can benefit from these. What are your key takeaways, Laura? <laughs> um, my key takeaways are um, some, reiterating some of what you just said, that this, this communication between oncologists, the pulmonologists, radiologists, surgeons, and pathology are really so important to help facilitate this process of getting uh, an appropriate diagnosis tissue to have ancillary testing and subsequently reporting the molecular findings and, and getting them back to you so that you can act on them. Um, that is a very important series of communications that need to happen. Um, I think institutions and, and clinical laboratories can establish some of their own protocols to help this make help this flow um, more smoothly and efficiently and with high success rates of testing. Um, I think another thing to take home is how valuable pathologists are in this role as tissue stewards in directing this ancillary testing and optimizing best methods and approaches with very little tissue that sometimes we have available to us, but it is, it is possible to do um, successfully. And how about for you, Dr. Pennell? What are some of your main take homes? Well, I think the most important one really is just to point out again how critically important it is that these be identified. Um, remember that many of the patients with these alterations uh, do not benefit from immunotherapy as, as well as, you know, sort of pan wild type lung cancer patients do. And so if you never identify a patient with a RET fusion as having that fusion and treat them with a RET inhibitor, they're sort of back to the 20th century where platinum doublet chemotherapy and, and median survivals of a year um, are, is, is what they're facing. Whereas with these drugs, now patients, you know, the selpercatinib trials, 60% of people still alive at three years. And so that's really what they're missing out on if you miss those patients. And that's kind of what I worry about, that this is happening uh, too much and we want to prevent. The other thing, of course, is just uh, the importance of education of patients, um, the role of uh, nurses and team members uh, in educating uh, providers on the uh, best practices for obtaining the tissue, for doing the testing, uh, educating uh, patients on the, the side effects and how to manage um, toxicities from these drugs and, and how to advocate for themselves to make sure that they're having all the adequate testing that they need. Great, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Pennell, for this lovely conversation and discussion that we've had today. And I hope the, everybody in the audience can take home something of value from this presentation.
And thank you, Dr. Tate, for joining me today and all of our listeners uh, for joining us today to learn about how better to manage patients with red alterations and other uh, uncommon alterations. Have a great day. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.